Warning, some of the images, film and information viewers may find disturbing. All the information and photographs are used for historical purposes only and not used to insult anyone from the time period. On a cold winter's night on the 5th of August 1944, on the outskirts of Kaura, Australia, 1,104 armed Japanese were preparing to attack. This is Australia at war. But should danger ever very bloody, Harry. Let the world know we will answer the call. By 1944, the war in the Pacific had turned against the Japanese. The Japanese military code says that not one Japanese soldier should be captured, but rather die for their country. The Japanese prisoners that were captured were often the prisoners that would resist the most. If the Japanese soldiers couldn't break out, they would often commit suicide or request to be allowed to commit suicide. In Australia, there are a total of 54 prisoners of war, or POW, and internment camps made for housing POWs and interning those who could be considered as enemy aliens. Near Cowra was prisoner of war camp number 12 opening in June 1941. The camp was built to house POWs, mostly Italian soldiers captured by Australians in Africa. There were a few Australians actually interned into the camp. There were roughly 500 Italians, Japanese and Indonesians, but again the camp was mostly used as a POW camp. The camp was divided into four compounds. Compounds A and C held Italians, B compound held Japanese soldiers and non-commissioned officers, and D compound held Japanese officers, Koreans and Chinese from Taiwan, which was occupied by the Japanese. Each compound was surrounded by three rows of relatively low barbed wire fences, with the average height being around six feet. This was due to the Cowra Prisoner of War Camp originally being built for low-risk prisoners such as Italians. The compounds were separated by two large roads that ran all through the camp. These roads were called No Man's Land, which ran from east to west, and the second road was called Broadway and ran from north to south. Now the road was called Broadway because it was lit up at night like Broadway in New York City. The guards were armed with 303 SMLEs, and around the camp were two Vickers machine guns and several Bren light machine guns. The two Vickers guns were placed at the stretch of the barbed wire fence. These Vickers guns were actually put into place at Kaura shortly after the Japanese prisoners of war started rioting in Philiston POW camp in New Zealand. 48 Japanese and one New Zealander died due to the incident. This very crude uh, map or diagram shows where the Vickers guns would have been. So number two Vickers gun would have been off to the left. It would have been just off where the photo is, uh, where the boundary fence is. It would have been off to the left a bit more. And number one Vickers gun was where those huts are, or if not, more to the right, uh, towards Broadway. Around the camp were six seven metre tall guard towers, and it was thought that an escape attempt was practically suicide. Lieutenant Colonel Montague Brown was a First World War veteran and the commander of the garrison at the camp. The guards were a part of the 22nd Garrison Battalion, and each of the four compounds of the camp were in charge with a major. Each compound had a garrison of approximately 100 men. So, the camp had a total of around 400 to 440 guards. That's the Jap compound over there. 
The first prisoners of Kaur lived in tents while the huts were being completed. Eventually, Kaur had its own stores, kitchens, mess huts, showers, and latrines. They also had recreation huts, shops, playing fields, and vegetable gardens. The first Japanese prisoners of war arrived at the camp in January 1943. The prisoners in the camp, led by Sergeant Major Hajime Toyoshima, were mainly captured in the New Guinea Islands. Toyoshima himself was captured on 19th February 1942 during the bombing of Darwin. And his capture story is one where you just have to... It's just unbelievable. So he was shot down and he was captured by an indigenous man who was hunting at the time. An indigenous man was only armed with a spear and snuck up behind him and simply said, hands up. The indigenous man then took Toyoshima's pistol and took him to the local police station where he was just handed over to the army. There's actually a statue of him on um, Bathurst Island where he was uh, captured. While the Italians accepted being captured by the Australians and were often very cooperative with the guards, so much so, Italian prisoners were actually allowed out of the camps to help the local farmers grow their agriculture and help around the houses. But the Japanese felt dishonourable and disgraced at being a prisoner of war, as it did go against the military code. When arriving to the camp, many Japanese POWs adopted aliases or fake names so their friends and relatives in Japan would think that they had died in honour during the war. Because when the Japanese... Capturing was not an option, so when they were captured, they were brought shame and they brought shame to their families. Even though the Japanese were unhappy with being prisoners, the camp and the camp guards did conform with the 1929 Geneva Convention. It was thought that an escape would be suicide, and if the Japanese somehow made it out of the camp, the Japanese had no chance of blending into the local populace and therefore would be caught again. Stop the count! There were rumours of planned escape attempts, but very few were actually carried out. But by June 1944, Compound B had a total of 1,104 inmates. To put that in comparison, each compound was designed to house 1,000. So it's clear that the compound was getting overcrowded and the camp needed to transfer hundreds of prisoners to other camps to make room for the prisoners and reduce the crowding. On the 4th of August, the Australian guards informed the Japanese prisoners that all prisoners who were lance corporals and privates would be transferred to the POW camp at Hay on the 7th of August. As of Monday, all Japanese ordinary ranks will be transferred to another camp at Hay. The Australians were acting on Article 26 of the 1929 Geneva Convention, the treatment of prisoners of war, which requires at least a 24-hour advance notification of all prisoner transfers and movements. Very bad business. Why can't we all go? The Japanese leaders of the compound asked that they not be moved, but the Australians had to follow their orders and the motion was going to be carried out. Now, throughout history, there has been discussion on why the Japanese decided to do it. And I myself, while researching this video, thought about how to, how to explain why they did it. But the best way I can explain how they did it is through this clip from the TV series, The Cow Breakout. Why will moving you cause trouble? Difficult to explain. The problem is very Japanese. We are in a shameful situation. A Japanese soldier should not be taken prisoner. It brings great shame on him and his family. What if he can't help it? We should die. What does this have to do with the move? Here in Kara, everyone is shamed. We are our group. The group is all we have. To move us, we'll destroy it. People will be confused. The strongest will lead. And to them, death is the only way.
You mean for a few? For everyone. And you? I am Japanese. This quote does give a good idea on what the Japanese mentality was during this time. So as the order was given, the Japanese were told that they were going to be separated and an argument ensued. The Japanese thought, do we attack or accept the Australian orders? The Australian order. Every hut took a vote, and the majority of that hut would decide the hut's vote, which would be life or death. Or all the hut leaders would then meet in, an, in a meeting and then decide whether they would all attack or accept the orders based on the outcome of the camp's vote. There is evidence to suggest that the vote was rigged. Now, I've seen this in the book, The Man Inside the Bloodiest Breakout by Graham Arthol. However, there's also seen in Japanese survivors saying that a lot of them wanted to live, but for some reason the choice of death was still accepted. Which, there is, it is debated on whether it was a unanimous decision to attack or it was rigged. I might make a separate video on this, um, depending how this video is received. Despite the arguments, the Japanese decided they would attack the Australians. The guards were weary and on watch as the Japanese prisoners were acting differently. They were running between the huts with big bundles of blankets and baseball bats and gloves. Look, they're at it again. That's blankets they carry. How long has this been going on? About the last half hour, mate. At the camp, the Japanese were allowed to play baseball, grow their own gardens, and play games that they play back in Japan. This was helped to comfort and hopefully stop their suicidal tendencies. The Australian guards knew something was up, but they didn't know what it was. Many of the officers thought it was because they were told they were going to be separated, but that wasn't the case. In reality, the Japanese were arming themselves. They'd get nails and put them in the baseball bats to make the baseball bats more lethal. The Japanese also armed themselves with kitchen knives and homemade knives. They would also be attacking with rakes and gardening tools. It was a quiet calm with his night. Around 2am, a Japanese prisoner ran to the gate and started saying that the Japanese were going to attack. He didn't know much English, so the warning didn't really get across. The Australian sentries then fired warning shots over the prisoner's head to get him to calm down. At around 2.05am, an unauthorised bugle was played by Toshima, the first Japanese to be captured in Australia, and then suddenly hundreds of Japanese soldiers came running out of their huts at the front gate screaming, Banzai! The sentries on duty were confused, but then quickly realised what was going on. Moments later, the sentries then opened fire on the attacking prisoners. Run! 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 
The Japanese took cover in ditches and behind the bodies of their fallen comrades. Some Japanese then went to the sides of the compound and started pulling blankets over the barbed wire so they could make their escape. They also used baseball gloves so the wire wouldn't cut their hands. Due to this, two Australian soldiers still in their pyjamas mounted the Vickers gun on a wagon on the western side of the compound. The Australians opened fire on the escaping Japanese, stopping them in their tracks. There was one problem with the Vickers gun emplacement. There was two bars on each side of the barrel of the gun. This restricted how far the gun could turn, and as a result, the Japanese prisoners of war were able to flank the position and start to advance on the Australians. Australian privates Hardy and Jones were being overrun and started to use anything they could as a weapon. One of the privates was even seen waving around a machine gun belt trying to defend himself. Despite all efforts, privates Hardy and Private Jones were unfortunately beaten and stabbed to death that night. The Japanese then mounted the gun and turned it on the Australians. The Japanese soldier on the machine gun pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. Miraculously, while being overrun and beaten, one of the Australian privates removed the lock from the machine gun, saving the lives of their mates and fellow guards. Private Ben Hardy and Private Ralph Jones were awarded the George Cross for their actions during the coward breakout. Private Hardy's medal citation reads, Private Hardy displayed outstanding gallantry and devotion to duty in his fight to death against an overwhelming onslaught of fanatical Japanese who stormed out over the perimeter armed with knives, baseball clubs and other weapons and bore down on the MG crew. Private Hardy stood his ground and continued to work his gun until bashed to death by the Japanese who were worked up to a state of frenzy with the object of either wiping out the garrison or getting wiped out themselves. The Japanese who mounted the Vickers guns were then killed by the Australian guards. As he was leaving his hut, Private Charles Shepherd was also stabbed to death by the Japanese. Not one Japanese prisoner who was able to cross the roads which separated the compounds survived. As a matter of fact, the fire from the Australians was so deadly that 200 Japanese prisoners trying to escape this way crept into a deep stormwater drain, which was also really a ditch, and they just waited. By now, the Japanese who did not attack had set their huts on fire and started attacking or killing themselves. Despite the Australian defence, 330 of the Japanese prisoners of war managed to escape into the Australian bush. In the distance, the escaped prisoners could hear the gunfire, shouting and screaming from the camp. When they turned around, they could see the flames of the huts which had been set alight. Nobody knows how the Japanese fought at this point, and we most likely never will. The next morning, the rounding up of prisoners began. The Royal Australian Air Force, the local police, the Australian Imperial Force trainees from the 19th Infantry Training Battalion, and members of the Australian Women's Battalion were involved in the roundup of the Japanese escapees. In total, it took nine days for the last of the prisoners to be recaptured. Most of the Japanese killed themselves before they could be recaptured. Some surrendered peacefully, others did not. Two on, Japanese yeah. prisoners threw themselves into an oncoming train. On the 5th of August 1944, just a few hours after the attack, patrols were then sent out around Kaura. That morning, 11 kilometers from Kaura, a patrol of trainees spotted a group of Japanese prisoners of Come war. The, the Japanese had also spooked the trainees and started to walk over. 
Lieutenant Harry Doncaster went to investigate. He was then ambushed by the Japanese prisoners and unfortunately murdered. A veteran of that night, Private Lionel William Brimble of the 19th Battalion recounts what he was doing on the night of the breakout. Good. Well, on the 4th of August, I was duty driver. I did the 7 o'clock truck into Cowra for the officer's truck. I left at midnight from outside the police station to take the officers back home. I then came back and did the 1.35 departure train for Melbourne. I was on my way back to camp when I could see all the fires burning. The moment I pulled into the transport lines, Corporal Mick Vanslow, who was on duty that night, ran out and said, don't put your truck away, the Japs are out. I said, I can see the fires. He said, go to the 19th Battalion, pick up a load of troops and take your orders from the field officer of the day. I said, I'll go and pick up my rifle from the top of the transport line where we slept in tents, picked up the troops in the 19th Battalion, they were all given band layers of ammunition and went straight to the POW camp. I was the first truck there. Were you armed? Yes. What were you carrying? Three and a three. Then you had uh, ammunition and as well? Yeah, clips of ammunition, mm. five rounds of clip. Had you been given any instructions about using it? Well, we were told to shoot to kill. Uh, when you went into the camp, how many men did you take with you? In the truck, probably mm. 20, 24. And they were all armed? All armed. Everyone was armed. What time would that have been, do you reckon? I was getting around the 2 a.m. It was pretty soon after the breakout. Pretty break soon after. Mm. Well, I mean, the moment the breakout took place, they fired the very lights, which alerted the guards on our ammunition dump, mm. which then gave the signal that they were out, and that's when we had to pick up the troops and take them there. We didn't go into the Broadway, but we went on the outside of the compound, of the Japanese compound. Mm. They were still going over the wire. 19, yeah. I, I thought to myself, these, some of these young fellas are probably the same age as me. They've got mothers and fathers and so forth. And, you know, you, you wonder whether you should be pulling the trigger. Um, I, I thought that um, maybe in some instances they shouldn't have all been shot. I thought maybe, you know, unless they're really making a deliberate effort to get out, I mean, just leave them be. Do you think that's the way the the others felt that you'd just brought in? I think there was a certain amount of anger knowing that uh, Privates Hardy and Jones have already been Possibly. I mean, there's bullets going everywhere and people mm. falling. I mean, who's to say which bullet, you know, got them? Yeah. At daybreak we were told not to touch any of the bodies, uh, I think the, the word mentioned was the Swiss, Swiss Consulate and the Geneva Red Cross would be coming to inspect the scene to mm -hmm. make sure it wasn't a massacre. Then I went into the mess hut and they had shepherd's pile for breakfast, I got that and I went to sit down and as I did I looked up and there were two Japanese swinging for rafters in the mess hut. I thought well I didn't really feel hungry. I got my cup of tea and left. They'd left the bodies hanging, and, and, and they expected you. Yeah. Expected well, they you to. Allowed to take them down. Yeah. Just hanging there, with their eyes bulging out. No, how they got up to get to the rafters, I, you know, they got the gable and the beam across. How mm. they got up there, I don't know. Uh, but they were there. Which which mess hut was this? This, that? Is, this is the mess hut in the POW camp. The events of the fifth of August shocked the nation. It was front page news. When Australia formally told Japan about the breakout, Japan refused to believe that there were any Japanese prisoners of war in Australia, and then accused the Australians of killing innocent Japanese civilians. A military court of inquiry investigated the incident, and the 8th of September, the court findings were presented to the House of Representatives by Prime Minister John Curtin. The court found that the conditions of the camp were in full accordance with the Geneva Convention. There were no complaints regarding treatment of the Japanese prisoners prior to the incident. 
the actions of the guards in resisting the attack averted greater loss of life, and that the firing form the Australian guards ceased as soon as the situation was under control, and that many of the dead had died due to suicide and many of the wounded had self-inflicted wounds. Prime Minister Curtin also stated that the attack was characterised by a suicidal disregard of life. The camp continued to operate as a prisoner of war camp until the end of the war. After the war ended, the camp was dismantled and the last prisoners of war were expatriated. They were sent to their respective homelands, such as Japan or Italy, where the former POWs just faded back into their country's societies. In the decades since the breakout, Cairo has become a centre of world friendship. The town boasts a very positive relationship with the former enemy, the Japanese. Those Australians and Japanese soldiers who died on Australian soil lie side by side peacefully in the Cowra War Cemetery, which was officially opened in 1963. I'd just like to say that I've been to the site of the Cowra War Cemetery in the Cowra Camp. The cemetery is a beautiful place with the Japanese gardens and the bronze peace bell, which is one of only seven in the world. The cemetery is left cared for and is peaceful and is a quiet place. There is a lot of respect here. There isn't much left of the camp. A few signs and a memorial are located on site, followed by a replica guard tower. What is left of the camp is mainly foundations to the huts and buildings. If you're ever in Australia, I would recommend you would take one day off to visit the site of the camp, the War Cemetery and the Japanese Gardens. This area of Australia truly shows how far and how close Australia and Japan have come since the end of the war. Thank you for watching, and this was Australia at War.